Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be, to be here with, with all of you. Thanks to the organizers, obviously. Thank you to the OECD, uh, which co-sponsors this, uh, this great panel. Maybe you will think, uh, yet another panel on youth. <laughs> yet another panel on youth in the, in the Mediterranean. I'm sure you have attended a lot of them already. Then uh, how on earth will I be able to convince you that this one is so special? Uh, except, of course, the fact that this is happening here in MED and that MED is so special. Uh, well, first answer, look around the fantastic uh, panel. We'll have great insights into a wide range of, of issues. And maybe my second answer will be the timing. Uh, we are, and that's also something we hear in a lot of debates in MED, we are the special juncture. The socio-economic indicators are quite bad uh, around the MENA region. The, the number of youth with no employment, no education, no training, as you know, the famous needs, right? Uh, and I should add maybe no access to foods, no resource to deal with inflation, uh, no access to so social security. Well, that number grows, okay? So my point is that I think now everyone realizes that uh, on both shores of the meds, empowering youth, addressing the challenges that I just mentioned, is not only an issue of human dignity. I mean, that's the, the, of course a very legitimate goal, but that's also an issue of security for governments on both shores of the Mediterranean. So I wanted to start a bit with a sense of urgency, and I think all of us can have this in mind while we go uh, through the panel, okay? So with no further delay, I'll, I'll move directly to the panel, to the first round of questions. I apologize in advance because we have no time for great uh, long introductions. You all have the bios of the speakers, obviously on the website. Uh, we'll start with the first round of questions and let me start with the co-host of these events, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Mr. Sidieli, you are indeed the Deputy uh, for Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. In my, right now, in my introduction, I say that governments around the region, I think, take very seriously these issues of, of youth empowerment, integration of youth, addressing these challenges that I just mentioned, uh, because there is a growing security concern about the impacts of this very, very critical situation. How does this resonate with the government of, of Italy? To what extent do you see that the situation of youth across the MENA region is indeed a, a, a security concern uh, for, for Italy? Mr. Deputy Foreign Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you uh, very much. I'm very glad to be able to take part in this uh, panel. Now, I have been uh, holding this mandate for about a month, and I take a lot of pride in it. But I also uh, feel pressed to, to take care of many things that need taking care of. And in the Mediterranean area, uh, the, the questions of the exclusion of young people, uh, especially in Northern Africa and the Middle East, and also Southern Italy, is a great challenge for the international community, the Mediterranean area, and the European Union, which is to place a guiding role uh, towards various processes, um, especially with regard to the future of new generations. And Italy is aware of its responsibilities, both historically and geographical and since, since it is to focus on the challenges of the future, the challenges that young people will have to face in the future. And we are very aware of the fact that 50% of, of the inhabitants of the Mediterranean area is aged below uh, 30. We are, uh, we are very aware of that fact, and that has a 
huge impact on our community. But we are also aware of the fact that young people are the centerpiece of our ability to, 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 to support uh, safety and security and development. And peace as a broader concept. Peace cannot be achieved without a balanced development, without cultural development, especially within the framework of a multilateral conception of politics. Now, we are very we are uh, very interested in UN programs, and Italy is on the forefront in supporting all UN actions that have to do with young people. And we have a very important instrument in this regard, namely uh, international cooperation. And I believe that Italy is doing what it has to in this regard, but we also want to do more. We want to do more as a government. I have a chance to go back to this, to the role of Italy in this regard in, this, in the second round. Ms. Uh, Jones, you are the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD. Thanks a lot for being here with us as well. So if you co-sponsor this event, obviously it means that I will not need to convince you on the, <laughs> on the importance of empowering youth and, and addressing all these, these challenges and, and needs. Um, in, this, in, this, in any debate on empowering youth, the, the issue of trust, mm -hmm. I'm sure, I mean, this is, all of you know, is an issue that comes up very, very regularly. Now, in the light of your experience with the OECD, uh, maybe my, my question would be, um, what are, you know, what are the key insights from your work on how governments around the region can restore this uh, trust among the, the young people? especially at this critical juncture, COVID, the war in Ukraine, and et cetera. The floor is yours. Thank you, Emmanuel, for that question. Um, let me start by, whoa, let me start by not echoing. Let me start by thanking Italy's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Italian Institute for International Political Studies for the excellent cooperation. We are particularly thankful to Italy for its leadership in steering the OECD's work with the Middle East and North Africa region including as co-chair of the MENA OECD governance program. Um, as we all know, the COVID crisis has left many painful scars on our societies, especially on young people. We now have Russia's aggression in Ukraine and the repercussions on the economic outlook, inflation and food security in the MENA region also hitting young people very hard. Nearly four in 10 young people in MENA live in fragile and conflict affected areas and nine out of 10 children live in areas of high or extremely high water stress. And this exposes them to additional environmental risk. The impact of all of these crises if left unaddressed will continue to undermine young people's opportunities in life and, and continue to impact the already low levels of trust in public in institutions. Across the MENA region, I think a lot of you know trust is low for young people in their government. To only 20, only 28 percent of um, young people trust their government. Data from the 2021 OECD Trust Survey shows that countries in the MENA region are not alone in this challenge. On average, across OECD countries covered by the survey, only 37% of young people express trust in government compared to 46% of those aged 50 and over. Trust is important because governments have to rely on a trustful relationship with citizens of all ages in order to build support for reforms and long-term policies. At the same time, governments, governments need to trust young people and empower them, for they're the agents of positive change in public life. This is crucial to the long-term health of our society and the strength of democracy. To support governments in this effort, uh, OECD has analyzed new comparative evidence across 10 MENA public administrations. Let me share a couple of key findings from that report, which is entitled Youth at the Center of Government Action, which has been delivered thanks to the financial support of Italy's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Three important messages from that report that stand out are first, inclusive budgeted, budgeting and cross-sectoral youth policies will deliver better outcomes for young people. At least seven public administrations in MENA region have adopted national youth strategies 
to promote a coordinated approach in support of young people across different ministries. However, implementation challenges, such as limited administrative capacities and weak coordination mechanisms, risk limiting their impact. This is an area where greater support is required, not only in MENA countries, but in many countries around the world. Second, when young people are engaged systematically in policymaking, they tend to express higher satisfaction with policy outcomes. The participation of young people in public life and their representation in public institutions remains limited. They are less likely to vote in elections than older people. In addition, people aged under 40 represent only 16% of members of parliament in the MENA region on average. In some countries, high age requirements present a barrier for political engagement. For instance, the age to run for office varies across the MENA region from 18 years of age to 35 years of age. It is promising to see though that Jordan has recently lowered its minimum age requirements and Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan have introduced youth quotas. Young people need to have both the opportunities and the, and the support they need to effectively engage, to effectively engage. Governments can take proactive steps to engage young people through public consultation, consultations, deliberative processes, or youth councils. For instance, Egypt and the United Arab Emirates have an operational national youth council in place, and Morocco and Tunisia are in the process of establishing those. Third and finally, OECD evidence shows that in countries with low age-related inequalities, overall life satisfaction is higher. The good news is that our report points out that the hidden, there is hidden potential across MENA countries. That is, there is the ability to gather age disaggregated data and apply public management tools to anticipate the impact of new legislation on young people. This enables policymakers to systematically mainstream young people's considerations in policymaking. So I think that there's a lot that can be done and I think there's a lot underway and with the data, a lot more can be done. Thank you. Back to the, to the footprint of the OECD on, on this youth empowerment agenda. Speaking about youth empowerment agenda, eh, I'm, I'm pleased to also have a, to welcome Dubai Abul Hul to the, to the panel. You are among other things, the, uh, the CEO of a, a, an, an Emirati think tank, the Fikr Institute, if I pronounce it yes. right. Uh, you are interested among other things in, in, in how mainstreaming culture uh, literature can help making the case of youth empowerment in the in the region. Can you maybe tell us more about that? How does culture uh, uh, help the promotion of positive narratives? You know, there are a lot of discussions about narratives these days. Uh, so how can this this help also in strengthening youth uh, people's civic engagement? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, does this work? Okay. Yes. Um, I, I wanted to start off by saying you know, thank you very much for, for having me uh, on this panel today. Um, I think we cannot talk about youth empowerment before addressing the, the need for having a fundamental paradigm shift in how we view youth, uh, both in terms of our uh, global economy as well as in different national contexts. You know, how do we have conversations like the ones we're having today um, without it being theatrical empowerment of youth, you know, let's just bring in a couple of young people, call it a day, you know, tick the box and, and think that that's it, that's all we have to do. Um, we need to take it a step beyond that and we need to take it a step beyond just rhetoric. And the empowerment of youth, particularly in policymaking across different sectors, should not just be a policy preference, you know, it is the only way forward. And, and I say this because when we look at some of our biggest challenges today, the emergence of, of disruptive technologies when it comes to things like AI, for example, um, and how that impacts um, more traditional topics, as they say, like security, or the emergence of platforms like the metaverse, or how social media platforms uh, quite literally are transforming international affairs as we know it. All of these challenges are 10 times more intimidating to older generations than they are to ours. And, and so we need to, to reassess, you know, um, what it means nowadays when it comes to equating years of experience with years of relevance uh, when it comes to different challenges around the world. So, you know, why do we still have to adopt a model across different sectors of 
you know, you need to have 20, 30, 40 years of experience before you get the opportunity to enact actual policy change. Uh, when these, when we're technically all, despite of what generation you belong to, we're all witnessing these um, disruptive changes quite literally at the same time. These are all new challenges to all of us. And so instead of looking at youth as, you know, this little group we're going to bring in every now and then into a panel, uh, <laughs> let's just put them in actual decision-making circles and actual decision-making tables. So instead of saying, let's just talk about youth affairs, Let's actually put youth on topics like climate, yes. on yes. topics like, like empowerment. Yes, but in some cases, it, it, it can be difficult. There may yes. be uh, barriers, and that's why I will turn to Marwa Luati now. Uh, Marwa, you have a lot of experience in, in civil society engagement uh, in your country and, and beyond it. Uh, we were just discussing before what could make this, this uh, participation or representation difficult in some case, can you maybe elaborate on these barriers based on your experience and what you're seeing sure. uh, on a daily basis? Not the um, thank you. First, I'm also very pleased to be here on this panel. And um, reflecting on my country's experience, I'm from Tunisia. There has been like 12 years since the revolution. And clearly there have been strands in terms of improving youth participation, whether on institutional or legislative levels we've seen uh, two constitutions so far. We've seen some laws about access to information, protecting whistleblowers, incorporating institutions that uh, protect the rights and freedoms, and also laws that uh, guarantee the freedom for association and political organizing. Um, so overall, we can see like the country has advanced in some ways on developing um, an enabling environment for youth participation, especially that we also seen that Tunisia joined the Open Government Initiative, which promotes transparency and fighting against corruption and includes a huge component on youth participation uh, in terms of establishing local councils, in terms of uh, um, strengthening the presence of youth uh, and the platform for youth engagement. We've seen also that the state since 2011 has made effort to develop uh, national youth strategies Yet so far, the strategy has been only sectoral, unfortunately, led mostly by the Ministry of, of uh, Youth and Sports. And in that, in that regard, like the strategy was developed between 2016 and 2020. It was meant to be as a first step into integrating a fully uh, national strategy that is comprehensive and holistic. Uh, what has been achieved in that, in, in the, in that strategy is uh, capitalizing on uh, youth centers as a rally for youth representation at community level. So it adopt, uh, adopted a bottom-up approach that goes well with the decentralization agenda of the country since 2011 and the 2014 constitution. Let's see with the, what the new constitution will, will bring to the floor. But at the same time, we can see like the strategy has not been fully implemented. And with the political upheavals and the political instability, especially after the presidential election, these strategies were short-term. As it was meant to be only a first step, it did not continue. Like so far after 2020, there hasn't been any move toward national implementation or development of a national youth, youth strategy that incorporates the economic component. Because so far, what we have seen is that, okay, we're bringing young people to participate and to participate in those policy debates. But the region, not only Tunisia, the region, the MENA region, the main problem is the social and economic component. And if we're short-sighted on, on delivering real solutions to these economic problems, we will remain into this migration phase. Some of the challenges that we're seeing uh, today, especially um, relate to the, the sectoral nature of the strategies that are being developed. The second thing is the low institutional capacities in terms of implementing and coordinating strategies uh, on youth. The third component I would say is like reliance on donors uh, to, to implement these strategies. The state does not finance youth policies as much as it should be. Thank you, thank you very much. We're moving to the second round of, of questions. So I have, it's my obligation then to I encourage the, the panelists to um, to go down to two minutes for, for answers. Mr. Deputy Foreign Minister, uh, would you like to tell us more about the what you 
uh, end up, end up uh, with now a, a few minutes ago about initiatives supported by Italy uh, at the multilateral and EU levels to support youth empowerment, including through cultural diplomacy initiatives, because we, we talked about culture, of which Italy is known to be a, a, a champion, uh, in particular across the MENA region. Well, it is clear that uh, Italy is fully aware of its responsibilities, and we know that we have to decline them, to implement them, and not simply state them. So they have to be followed by real actions. We participate at the Global Partnership for Education, which is the main partnership for the sex to education in developing countries. We try to guarantee education among young generation and the knowledge. And so we issue, we grant scholarship, we guarantee a mobility among our institution. There are more than 1,500 agreements between the Mediterranean countries and the Italian institution, more than 300 scholarship granted to young generations, to young people living in this area. And we also support education and culture in the Mediterranean area, also using the passion for the Italian language. There are 17 institutions in the Mediterranean area where Italian is taught and such institutions are financed by Italy. We try to enhance the value of Italian culture and we are talking about art and music. We know that our country is very much loved and there are many interesting projects. I would like to mention also the initiatives uh, and of involving young people in the climate issues. In Europe, we are fully committed to reduce emission. We know that Italy is fully committed, but we also know that this is not enough. We need a specific action. And uh, both at COP26 and COP27, we strongly wanted to involve young people with the Youth for Climate Initiative because we believe that this is one of the key elements to give uh, a significant contribution. Generally speaking, about cooperation, Italy is supporting the Mediterranean countries and uh, Italy tries to put young people and women at the core of its action. In the future, we would like to move part of our actions and cooperation focusing on education. Probably over the last few years, we have, fo we have been focused on health and food, certainly essential needs, but probably we should focus more on education and culture, and this will be one of the future actions within the international cooperation. It is really interesting, and I would like to involve Dubai again. Abbiamo Uh, capito dalle parole di Dubai che è importante parlare di coinvolgimento dei giovani. Ci sono molte iniziative, ci sono borse di, di studio, ci sono molte iniziative, ma c'è anche ancora tanta frustrazione perché ci sono tanti giovani che vorrebbero viaggiare, che vorrebbero studiare, che vorrebbero eh, conoscere altre culture, vorrebbero visitare altri paesi, vorrebbero avere più possibilità e il fatto di non averle genera frustrazione. Non dobbiamo sottovalutare l'impatto di tutto questo. Quindi eh, quello che ha, detto, che ha appena detto il ministro è importante, ma vorrei capire da Dubai se c'è qualche cosa in più, se c'è qualcosa 
in più che possiamo fare, se possiamo andare oltre alle sfide economiche e sociali, se possiamo occuparci anche di occupazione e come vede lei il ruolo dell'istruzione in tutto questo della cultura? Quando parliamo di istruzione, soprattutto quando parliamo di istruzione superiore o universitaria, la nostra regione, il nostro paese deve essere ancora più inclusivo, il più inclusivo possibile. Ovviamente questa è una, è una preoccupazione che abbiamo e eh, vedo un po' la tendenza da parte di alcune università a creare una sorta di bolla. Ma è importante invece essere coinvolti completamente, diventare realmente membri di questa squadra, anche quando si parla di forza lavoro, di impiego. Dobbiamo condividere le iniziative, dobbiamo fare proposte, eh, non dobbiamo solo prendere appunti e non c'è nulla di strano nel farlo, ma dobbiamo proprio essere attivamente, fattivamente coinvolti. Ci sono nuove forme di conoscenza. E dobbiamo eh, abbracciare il mondo digitale perché può dare tante opportunità e questo mondo digitale può essere applicato a tutti i settori, dovrebbe essere eh, pienamente integrato in tutte le istituzioni. Onestamente non farlo eh, è una grossa opportunità persa. Grazie. Vorrei parlare di nuovo la parola, passare di nuovo la parola al segretario generale, vice segretario generale, abbiamo parlato di eh, governi, ma ci sono altre domande istituzionali eh, alle quali eh, OECD può dare un grande contributo. Il contributo della vostra organizzazione ha ovviamente sostenuto il dialogo politico, lo scambio di esperienze e ha dato un contributo generale a dare più potere ai giovani. Che cosa può aggiungere? Beh, mh, grazie per aver ricordato il ruolo di OECD, perché non possiamo limitarci ad una regione, ad un paese. Noi abbiamo un approccio molto di, di, di grande respiro, di ampio respiro. Vogliamo coinvolgere tutti quanti e vogliamo condividere con le persone quello che sta succedendo perché è importante che le persone siano anche informate dei successi e quello che noi stiamo facendo vogliamo che sia condiviso con altri paesi, perché eh, proprio recentemente abbiamo eh, elaborato delle raccomandazioni e abbiamo cercato di dare delle nuove opportunità, abbiamo cercato di supportare soprattutto i giovani e queste raccomandazioni ovviamente sono il frutto della nostra esperienza duratura in molti paesi. Abbiamo avuto molte discussioni tra di noi, tra pari, per elaborare queste raccomandazioni e ovviamente le nostre iniziative anche focalizzate sui paesi del MENA eh, sono importanti e mirano a creare una connessione, a promuovere il dialogo regionale sui argomenti estremamente importanti. Molto è già stato fatto, una rete è già stata in qualche modo creata. Noi abbiamo un centro di formazione presso OECD, ma vogliamo coinvolgere eh, i politici, i giovani, coloro che devono decidere. Abbiamo coinvolto anche i ministeri eh, che si dedicano ai giovani dei paesi come il Marocco e la Germania. Vogliamo che siano parte integrante di questi progetti, che contribuiscano all'organizzazione di questi progetti in vari settori e che siano attivamente coinvolti. Quindi eh, quello che sta creando OECD è uno spazio multilaterale che è fortemente orientato a favorire il dialogo. E quindi noi abbiamo elaborato queste raccomandazioni, queste sorte di linee guida che però possono essere applicate in molti ordini del giorno di molti paesi in una maniera multilaterale. Passiamo adesso a questo secondo giro di eh, opinioni e consultazioni. Nei, nel tuo paese, il Libano, è, è da sempre... Eh, 
importante il coinvolgimento della società civile, ma probabilmente negli ultimi decenni, soprattutto in Tunisia o in paesi come il Libano, eh, ci sono state... Eh, ci sono state delle reazioni da parte della, delle giovani generazioni che eh, magari si sono sentite in qualche modo minacciate. Beh, questo, quello che sta succedendo vi ha in qualche modo preoccupato, vi preoccupa? E com'è il rapporto tra i giovani e la politica nel suo paese? Questa è la domanda. Prima di tutto, quando parliamo della, civiltà, della eh, società civile, Dobbiamo ricordare che noi dobbiamo sempre considerare quello che sta succedendo a livello politico. La Tunisia è un paese che si sta evolvendo, che sta sempre di più coinvolgendo la civiltà civile, la società civile, ma non solo in termini di proteste, ma in termini di eh, coinvolgimento fattivo che ha eh, un impatto sulla Costituzione che è stata recentemente adottata solo pochi mesi fa. Quindi quello che stiamo cercando di fare è cercare di proteggere questo spazio, questa libertà, questi diritti. Uh, cerchiamo di proteggere i diritti delle associazioni, i diritti associativi, i diritti dei partiti politici. I partiti politici e la società civile, magari come è accaduto nel passato, non devono essere in competizione e proprio questa competizione spesso non ha consentito un coinvolgimento reale, è stato un po' un fallimento proprio perché non c'era un dialogo, quindi non dobbiamo necessariamente creare delle accademie, dobbiamo semplicemente lavorare assieme. E non dobbiamo dividerci in varie fazioni. Magari eh, ci sono persone che hanno iniziato ad essere coinvolte eh, nell'azione politica nel 2012 o nel 2015, ma eh, assieme a questi movimenti più formali abbiamo visto il formarsi anche di molti movimenti eh, spontanei e quindi dobbiamo sostenere la società civile e al tempo stesso le organizzazioni politiche. Dobbiamo mettere a disposizione le nostre risorse, dobbiamo sostenere l'organizzazione, dobbiamo capire quali sono le necessità, quali sono i punti all'ordine del giorno e dobbiamo eh, proprio agire in modo da favorire le politiche future che siano ampiamente coinvolgenti. Questo uh, panel è molto speciale perché solitamente in questi eventi abbiamo i rappresentanti, i più giovani soprattutto, che sono un po' relegati nella parte finale. Ma noi quest'anno abbiamo deciso di adottare un approccio diverso e abbiamo due rappresentanti uh, del, dello Youth Forum e sono qui seduti con noi e possono interagire, dialogare direttamente con i nostri panelist. Do il benvenuto a Rin Halatadin, che fa parte di un think tank presente in Giordania e poi abbiamo con noi Rachele De Angelis. Chiediamo ad entrambi di dirci velocemente che cosa state facendo e che cosa, su cosa vi state concentrando, su cosa si sta concentrando la vostra azione. Grazie per questo pensiero gentile, grazie per questa accoglienza e per questa possibilità. Ovviamente oggi parliamo e chi, se non noi, i giovani, siamo in charge di advocating per questo. 
um, and especially in the Mediterranean, that is our region, uh, where energy is so linked with, uh, with water and energy security as well, and food security. Well, climate mitigation is the subject matter for the coming years. Yet to make it really feasible, we also need to change the way we, we really approach it. We often talk about this multi-stakeholder approach, but yet, it, yet this is nothing but putting at the people at the center of this discussion enabling their voices to be heard, their needs to be met, and finally, the, their opportunities to be fully explored. Um, and this is where we decided to, to, to directly call the, the government's actions. Uh, governmental action with legislation, with regulation, but also incentives through, through, through fundings and grants should encourage the green transition in this area while maintaining a constant social dialogue. A dialogue that connects uh, national priorities with the needs of the local communities and the vulnerable groups, and consider the urgent needs of creating a vibrant entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial uh, environment that will be quintessential for you. So to do this, uh, we, with my group, uh, we recommended uh, the governments to, to rely on a few innovative tools as we uh, kind of explored during our forum. So first of all, boosting uh, renewable energy development as an economic opportunity first. And, and to do this, uh, we, we decided to, to connect uh, three main points, which were launching the first regional social bond to encourage private actors, businesses, and households to raise funding in order to achieve objectives that are compatible with the green transition. Then expanding or launching, where absent, innovative centers for startups and universities to develop feasible ideas for the, for the area. And then structuring local action plans in collaboration with local institutions and community representatives to promote renewable and sustainable energy projects by, by matching them with the development needs for specific regions. Second tool, a new framework for funding, uh, the funding of uh, vulnerable communities, but this time aimed at redirecting the existing support that uh, already exists for livelihood, massively dependent on fossil fuels actually, into forward-looking, sustainable green solutions. And third, a regional framework for waste, uh, for waste management, mainly based on two directions that will be crucial for climate mitigation. Firstly, incentivizing research and development and first application of electricity generation from waste. And then building an agreement of refurbishing of electronic devices, as it happens at EU levels, for a concrete production reduction and CO2 cut. To achieve all of this, that is a true multi-stakeholder approach, we can say, where both the public and the private sectors are involved, we finally cre called to create a regional platform that would gather the needs of and the existing solutions of climate mitigation for the whole Mediterranean region. The platform would be, will give visibility to the local communities and stakeholders involved for a better and coordinated sharing of the know-how. And at the same time, it would also increase the awareness of the urgency of climate action, but through this time, a bottom-up, constant, and inclusive dialogue with all the stakeholders involved. We also urge the young people, actually, to play a key role in this platform. Uh, we are growing up as probably the most uh, engaged generation with the highest level of awareness on the urgency of climate change. And most of us are already dedicating their professional, even personal lives into that. So we showed the world um, how urgent climate action is, and we showed how engaged we are and how fruitful our impact can may be. We now need your trust um, to have us on board for this tough, but I can say really amazing challenge that history is urging us to embrace. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you for your energy, Rim. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel, for the previous introduction. Um, I, I'm happy to present our group's uh, findings and concrete initiatives. I think climate adaptation goes hand in hand with mitigation. As you all might know, climate change adaptation is a key topic in, for many countries in the WANA region, West Asia, North Africa region, given it's not a major uh, contributor to the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, regional climate change projections predict an increase in temperature between 1.75 degrees Celsius. This will be accompanied 
by extreme weather events such as drought and flood, um, impacting food, water, and livelihood securities, as we all heard of. Uh, today, I'll be presenting the group's thoughts and findings, as I said, on climate change adaptation with a deep dive on specific priorities, which are the role of financing, um, importance of behavioral change, and youth and local community empowerment, which are all embedded in our initiatives. Um, the following uh, proposed initiatives are region-wide with a local sense and roots. Um, another fact, according to the World Bank, drought in Africa is leaving more than 58 million people in conditions of acute food security, as well as in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. We've seen in the past between 2015 and 2018, uh, the drought, the consecutive drought days has left many economic losses in all of these countries. Um, the first initiative darkly speaks to this, an agricultural relief fund, which connects Nouakchott to Amman in Turkey. The fund proposes a matching system in terms of financing, meaning we have a 70% of relief and around 30% sustainable technical aspect. Um, which supports small farmer holders that are exposed to drought and extreme weather events. Um, another on our next initiative, which you can all see, we've kind of do a, a graphic that you can look at. This is not all of it is there. Um, our next initiative highlights the role of cities, uh, not countrywide, uh, more on the cities and the local sense is bringing the low carbon development perspective and its interlinkages with transport, water, and other sectors. The graphics behind me showcase the parameters the award will depend on. So it's an award. Uh, the MED Green Adaptation City of the Year Award is a fusion of environment and urban perspectives. The criteria are equally weighted and gauged, as you can see. Uh, to include environmental parameters, such as emissions per capita, which are GDP adjusted, air quality and green spaces that take into consideration geographic distribution. Um, and not, last but not least, we also look at the education and curriculum. We all spoke about the curriculum and the need to equip the next generation with the right information facts, uh, accompanied with technology, R&D and innovation, encourage applied research to facilitate technological innovation. Um, and I have to say the winning cities will be able to share the best practices um, with other countries regionally and internationally. Let's not forget the city can gain considerable uh, touristic traction uh, due to winning the award. Uh, cities will be judged um, on improvement from year to year. Uh, funds allocated for the winners will be by the World Bank, for example, the African Development Fund and EBRD. Uh, last but not least, our last initiative, uh, an exciting Polar Batuta Olive program um, that offers 500 students, 100 students each year for the first five years. And we aim to go beyond that for the next decade around 5,000, uh, which will equip with technical, the program will facilitate an exchange of technical expertise and agricultural condiment in which it will pair students from the Mediterranean universities with rural communities to share and help develop their businesses. Uh, it might be agricultural or green businesses. Um, and the exchange of it would be an exchange of expertise, know how, and cultural awareness. Funds will be allocated by the ministries of education. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And I'm I'm sure the findings of the youth lab will be will be made available by the organizers. So whomever may be interested in in all of this, I'm sure that will be made available. So before before we wrap up, so I would kindly invite the, the panelists to react uh, to what has been said. Maybe let's go for the reverse order. Uh, Marwa, I'm sure 
dealing with civil society and, and, and youth, I'm sure you hear all these, these concerns about climate change. So a lot of things may have resonated to, to you. So please. Absolutely. I, I will, first, our congratulations. It's like amazing uh, commitments, I would say, and recommendations that if in place, I think we would see the whole MENA region transforming into something, something else. Um, my, my, might be my um, um, recommendation is in terms of prioritizing uh, gender perspective into the climate action, because we know uh, from academic research, at least, that um, climate change affects more women than it does to men, especially in rural areas, and especially it even puts more poverty on the shoulders of women. So that's especially something that uh, needs to be maybe considered. And also, uh, at least from my country, and I know I've been in a few countries in the MENA, we don't even sort waste. So I think it's very, very important to start with, um, as you said, the educational system, to start with instilling this culture. And that's, uh, that would be a way to, to, go, to go forward. Uh, and um, the role of civil society is really important, especially in advocacy. Uh, if you have these recommendations, then I'm sure that uh, we will find ways across the MENA region where civil society, not just in one country, but in different countries, collaborate together to advance uh, these, these recommendations on a regional level. Yubai, do, do you want to go next? Yes, sure. Um, I think your brilliant proposals prove uh, that young people should be on the actual policy making <laughs> table. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> what I would recommend is at this stage, um, is to perhaps create an implementation partners plan um, because it would be you know, very sad, not just with the ideas you said, but also the findings of the youth lab to just be published online and that's where the conversation ends. So I would recommend, and I'm very happy to help with this as well uh, after the panel is, you know, how can we map um, partners, regional partners and global partners to actually get these ideas um, hit, hit, hitting the ground running. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think um, I want to join with others to congratulate both of you, Reem and Rachel. I think the policies you put out there are very impressive. And um, I think OECD has sponsored or been involved with this Med Youth Forum for years. And I think there's always an enormous amount of talent that comes forward. And you are the latest, um, and all of your colleagues who you've worked with. But I think the proposals you present are very interesting because. They do something that I think it's taken policymakers sometimes a little longer to get to, and that is recognizing the complexity of the problems that we're facing in both mitigation and adaptation, how they require whole of society um, approaches, and what that means on both the local and regional levels, and inclusion as well. So you brought in all of these pieces, and the, the only advice or sort of observation I would make is that I think one of the things that's always a tough issue when you get into this kind of complexity with this many moving parts is a very basic thing, and that's the management of it. And so great policies are very important to be so complex, but then really keeping the communities involved and everything moving at all levels. But I congratulate you. I think those were really excellent discussions. Thank you. And the le mot de la fin uh, for the co-host of this event, the deputy. Prime Minister. Sì, io voglio dire innanzitutto che per l'Italia. I would first and foremost like to say that Italy has always considered the Mediterranean and Italy as an integral part of Europe. And we believe that these two continents mm, have intertwined histories and destinies. That is why I would like to say, especially with regard, with regard to pollution, climate change, that Europe and Italy amount to 10% uh, of, uh, of uh, these changes. There are other uh, nations such as um, China, India, Brazil, uh, uh, as well as the United States, that need to do more. But what matters is 
protecting Africa from an external intervention that is aimed at exploiting the environment, which could then contribute to worsening the situation of uh, the African population, which in 2050 will amount to 3 billion people. And um, the well-being of the population is fundamental to, uh, to the well-being of, of the planet. And so, uh, since 